All right. Well, good morning, church. Boy, it's great to see you this morning, man. You're a good-looking bunch. You know that? Isn't it great to come to church where we can just experience just joy and the worship is incredible and gather together and just build up one another, encourage one another's faith, man? You are what makes this church awesome. You know that? You are just amazing. Turn to the person next to you, just slap a high five and just say, man, you make this place awesome. <laughs> what a great week with VBS. Wasn't that video, seeing all those kids, absolutely amazing. Man, I just want to say, man, thank you to all of you that, that volunteered and all of you that prayed and all of you that supported VBS and we had over 700 people total all week in this building, man, and they were just, they were just going for it. When I was young in ministry, I, I, I was taught this. I was taught that it's easier to reach the child than it is to repair the adult. And then, you know, what's being led, what's being built in those children all week is a foundation for their life, man. So it was incredible. And do you know that Jamie and her team, they write the whole thing. They created all of that. So can we give that team just another big hand? I just, what they put into that is absolutely amazing. I do have one reminder uh, for you, actually two. Uh, first one is uh, please remember to, to pray for Pastor Andrew and uh, his family, of course. Uh, I misspoke first service. He's in uh, Zambia right now with one of our Kingdom Builders partners and they're, they're building some churches and doing some great things. In fact, part of your kingdom builders went with him down there to pay for a building of, of one of those churches down there. And uh, I said that he was ministering this morning, but apparently he ministered last night. So while we were sleeping, he was preaching. So, uh, but your giving is, is really making that church down there. He's with Operation iDream. Again, it's one of our kingdom builders partners. So please keep... Uh, uh, his trip in your prayers and his family in your prayers, of course. And the second one I want to remind you of is this, is this Saturday is our first serve day that we are doing with ICLV. So we are just asking people to come out. We've got several projects throughout the city that we are going to be going and serving in. Um, we've got First Choice Pregnancy Center we're going to go do some stuff at. And then part of our, our, our Spanish community is going to be going down to Cardenas, um, they're going to be serving down there. They're going to be doing some stuff in the parking lot and assisting the people there. And uh, Cardenas is where my wife and I like to get the meat for our carne asada. So there, there's a question mark on whether or not some carne asada is going to be in the mix on, um, on uh, serve day on Saturday. So if you're thinking, oh, man, no, I'm gonna just, you know, I'll just let you wonder. <laughs> so... <laughs> But it's going to be a great time. The day's going to look like this. We're going to meet in the Life Center down there um, around 8.30. We're going to kind of gather. We're just going to pray, and then we're going to have our teams divided up. Then we're going to be leaving by 9 o'clock, go out to our different assignments. And we're going to serve for about two, two and a half hours. We'll come back around 12, 12.30. And we're going to have a time of testimonies. We're going to have a great lunch. And uh, we're just going to celebrate the opportunity to serve and so we want to encourage you to come on out on Saturday. It's going to be a great time uh, to do that. So over the next six weeks, we are going to jump into a study through the book of Philippians and how to live as a prisoner of joy. Our calling as believers is to be captivated by his love, but to live out his joy for the world to see. And if you really think about it, our society in many ways does not set up a person to live a life of joy. Worry, stress, and fear are among the top issues that steal joy and rob a Christian of the life God has called each one of us to. Chuck Swindoll calls these the joy killers, worry stress, and fear. When I was putting this together this week, I kind of did a little bit of searching, and I found some of the top things or the top areas of life that are a source of worry, stress, and fear in our society. And number one thing that came up was economic pressure. The American Psychological Association in 2022 
reported that inflation was a source of worry and stress for the vast majority of adults at 83%. The majority of adults also said that the economy and money are a significant source of worry and stress in our society. Another top issue in our society was family issues. Now, I know that no one in here has ever had a family member or a family situation that has ever caused you worry or stress or fear. My oldest son is now driving, and I am not okay with this. <laughs> but that's one of the top ones that cause people worry, stress, and fear is family issues. A third one was social media. There's lots of good that social media brings, but do you know that social media is also the leading factor of depression in teenagers today? The list goes on and on. Things that cause worry and stress and fear. And your list might have something with worry, stress, and fear. Do you know that the Gallup research poll in 2023 estimated this? 22% of American adults have experienced depression or anxiety so extreme that they could not continue regular daily activities or routines. The point of sharing that this morning is that we are not set up as families. Our society does not set us up to live a life of joy. So what are we to do as Christians when there seems to be that chasm of joy that we are called to and this thing called life, this reality of life that does bring pressure, it does bring worries, stresses, and fears. Well, friends, we got to know that faith does not deny reality. Faith is the choice to continue to press into God, to continue to seek God and serve God despite the realities that we may face. But the answer is this. It's where we choose to start. If you choose to start to deal with anything that's on your list or on this list from any place other than Jesus, joy will elude you. Isn't that a great churchy answer for Sunday morning? That the answer is Jesus? <laughs> that's a great churchy answer for Sunday. Oh, the answer is Jesus. You know, that's how I got through my college math. I had no idea about all those numbers and stuff. I just put Jesus is the answer. And it, Hope for half credit, you know, but, but if you think about it, and the worries, the stresses, and the fears of life, where we choose to start is going to make the difference because the deeper we are connected to Jesus and the greater the reality of his life, his power, his strength, and yes, his joy will manifest in your life. When Jesus is the center and the starting point, life's challenges have a whole different perspective and the fruit we bear is different. Do you know that next to love, joy is mentioned as the second fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23? It says, but the fruit, everyone say fruit. fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now notice in that verse, the word fruit is singular. It's not fruits, it's fruit. Because all nine virtues of the Holy Spirit are to be manifested in the life of the believer. They form, they form and, and compose a uniformed whole in the believer's life. Think of it this way. Think of it like a cluster of grapes that are all attached to one branch. And that branch being Christ, that when we are connected to him, the greater we are connected to him, the greater the reality of his fruit will be manifested in our life. Are you with me? All of them are to be found and functioning in the life of the believer. I read this statement earlier this week, and I really liked it from John Piper. He said this, he said, it's the Holy Spirit that sustains our faith so that we can continually lay hold of the promises of God 
for the joy that frees us for love. Isn't that good? It's the Holy Spirit and our connection to the Spirit of God that sustains our faith, that helps us grow in our faith so we can continually live out the call that God has on our life, to live out the joy that he has in our life and the promises of God that frees us up to love him and to love others. Joy is the keynote of the book of Philippians. My job today is to give an overview and to lay the foundation for this six-week study so that we can, like Paul, live as prisoners of joy. So turn to Philippians chapter 1, if you would. I want to give a little bit of background of this letter. And the verses that we're going to be sharing in the, in the next little bit are going to come out of the, 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 the ELP version of the Bible. And that's the extra large print. All right? That's, that's what that means, okay? For all you young people, enjoy the small print of the Bible now. And your eyesight, and your flexibility, and your hair. <laughs> so joy is the keynote of the book of Philippians. So let's get into a little bit of the background. The book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul and his co-leader Timothy, most likely from the Roman prison around 60 to 62 AD. And Philippians is possibly the first of four books that Paul wrote from his first Roman imprisonment here. The three other books are Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. The interesting part about this letter is that Philippians is a thank you letter to the Christians in the city of Philippi in gratitude for sending Epaphroditus to comfort Paul and bringing him a financial gift after he had heard about his arrest and imprisonment. This letter that Paul writes contains no rebuke or doctrinal corrections as Paul had to do in his other letters, like Corinthians. It's a church that the Apostle Paul has a special love for. He has a special connection to. He has a special place in his heart. Now, Paul loved all the churches that he planted, but there was something special about the people in the church of Philippi that he held dear to his heart. And the book of Philippians is four chapters, 104 verses, and 16 times the concept or, of, of rejoicing or the word joy appears in this letter, making Philippians a theme of joy. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter in AD 60 or AD 62 from prison. Now, let's back up 10 years to Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 40. In Acts chapter 16, this is what gives us the background in how the church began. So we're going to skim over this for reference, and I'm going to give you some uh, verses. If you want to, Acts chapter 16 is a phenomenal study. It's a great study to learn about how this church was planted. But Paul planted the church of Philippi during his second missionary journey in AD 51 in response to the Macedonian call of Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 10 which says this, during the night, Paul had received a vision from a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over here to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God has called us, and pre called us to go and preach the gospel to them. So as a result of this vision, the apostle Paul and the team head to Philippi. Now the rest of of Acts chapter 16 falls into four separate scenes as we lay this foundation, all right? I'm going to give these to you as reference. You can look them up later if you want. Acts chapter 16, verse 11 through 15 speaks about Paul and Silas and, and, and the team, Mark and Timothy. It's on their journey to Philippi. Now, normally when the apostle Paul would get to a new city, they would go to the synagogue. 
And that's where they would begin to meet, and that's where they would begin to preach and, and, and teach and do all the things that God would want them to do. But in Philippi, when they got there, there was no synagogue there. Now, it was a requirement to have j 10 Jewish men as the head of their households to form a synagogue. But Philippi was a Roman province, so it was probably most filled with Gentiles that were there. So when Paul and the team gets there, there's no synagogue, but what he does find is he finds a group of women that are out by the river and they're praying. So he goes to them, shares the message of the gospel. Now in that group, there was a lady there by the name of Lydia. The Bible says that Lydia was a seller of purple, which means that she was a very successful business woman. And she responds to the gospel message. She gets saved. She gives her life to Christ. And then she opens up her home for Paul and, and Silas and that whole team. So now their base of operations becomes out of Lydia's home. So the first group of converts, as Paul gets to Philippi, is this group of ladies. The second scene is Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 24. And what this deals with is this deals with the servant girl that was possessed by a demon. And the apostle Paul casts that demon out, and the owners of the girl, they know that their, their, their whole way of making money is now lost, so they bring these accusations against Paul and Silas. They get arrested, they get flogged, and they get thrown into prison. So that's the second scene. The third scene is Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. And this is a story that we all love. Because while Paul and Silas are in prison, they're raising their hands and they're singing hymns to God and they're praising God for what has been done. And then all of a sudden the earthquake comes. The earthquake comes and it shakes the foundation of the prison. Their chains fall off. And the Philippian jailer pulls out his sword because he's going to kill himself. And the Apostle Paul stops him. He says, no, 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 don't do that because we're all here. You don't need to kill yourself. And then what happens is the Philippian jailer tells Paul and Silas, man, what do I have to do to be saved? Because he sees the power of God. And the Philippian jailer gets saved. And it goes on that the Philippian jailer's his household gets saved. Everyone in his family gets saved. And then the fourth scene is Acts chapter 16, verses 35 through 40, and it's just the final encounter because Paul, as a Roman citizen, was flogged, and he had to deal with the magistrates on the treatment, the poor treatment that he received. So Acts chapter 16 gives us how this church was planted, but what I would point out to you is this. Paul's church plant consisted of a few women, a formerly possessed slave girl, a Gentile Roman jailer, and his family. This is what Paul's church planting committee looked like. He didn't have the worship leader. He didn't have the youth pastor, the children's pastor. He had, he had a group of women. He had a slave girl, and he had Gentiles that made up his church plant. And then 10 years later, when he writes the book of Philippians in planting the church, he remembers in Philippians 1.3, he says, I thank God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I pray with joy. This was the group of people that brought Paul so much joy when he planted the church. Now, my interpretation of that is this. I think the reason why that church brought Paul so much joy was because it was a church for all people. It was a church for everyone because that plant was made up of Gentiles, broken people, a group of ladies, the outcasts of society. I think that's why Paul loved this church, why he felt so connected to this church because it was a church for all people and everyone was welcome there. But in those 10 years, Paul walked through a lot in life. He walked through a lot of different experiences that formed who he was. And I want to read some of this out of 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 28, of the experiences of Paul. The Bible says this. He says, I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely, and I've been exposed to death again and again. 
Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. One night I spent a night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. Man, what a testimony of the church so far. <laughs> Gee. I have labored and toiled. I have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all of the churches. Man, Paul had some experiences with the church. And if there was anyone that should have been hurt or angry, bitter or disillusioned by the church, it should have been Paul, but, it's, but he's not. So my question is, what is the source of Paul's joy? What is the source that brought him such joy? He gives us some insight in the book of Philippians chapter 1 that although he is in prison, he is a prisoner of joy. So I want to give you four keys or four reasons, if you will, on the source of Paul's joy. And then we're going to pray. Number one, Paul's source of joy was in Christ. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, notice what it says here. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ. Now, if you have your Bible with you, just underline that word, servants. Because this is how the letter begins, that they are servants of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that his life is not about him anymore, but it's about living for Christ. That's what his life is. Is about. It's not about him anymore. It's not about his titles. It's not him about, about him being the Pharisee of Pharisees. It's not about him being a great lawyer, a great educator, about being a great persecutor of the church. Where Paul found his source and his, and his identity was in being a servant of Jesus Christ. And the word servant is better translated bond servant. And it means slaves, but it's not like transatlantic slavery where our mind automatically goes to. The servant or a bond servant of Christ is this. It's one who has surrendered wholly to another's will and thus devoted to another to the disregard of his own interest. That is what the Apostle Paul is saying. This is what he is saying. I am so connected to Christ that it's not about me anymore. In fact, the Greek word there is doulos, and it means this, to be completely sold out. Amen. Completely sold out. Paul and Timothy were no longer about their own selves or their own agenda. They knew they had been bought with the precious blood of Christ, and so they were no longer bound to worry or fear or insecurity. They were not defined by the prison that they were in because they experienced the freedom that was in Christ. They were sold out as servants of Jesus Christ. So the source of Paul's joy was in serving Jesus. His trials did not define him. His prison didn't define him. His circumstances didn't define him. His connection to Christ is what defined him. Number two, Paul's source of joy was in that the gospel was advancing. Let's jump down to verse 12. He says this, Now I know, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Now, Paul's been in prison for two years here, wondering if he was forgotten about, wondering if he was going to be executed. But in here, in this prison, in this dungeon, for two years, he has a source of joy knowing that the gospel is being advanced. Commentator Ralph Martin said it this way. He said, in spite of the hostility of his enemies outside the church and the evil designs of his detractors within the church, the Apostle Paul, greatly encouraged by one overriding fact, Christ is being proclaimed. 
Wasn't that good? That the gospel was advancing, and that's where he found joy. In fact, the word advance is a very interesting word in this passage of Scripture. It means this. It means to cut before. It's a military term that refers to an army of engineers who go before the troops to open the way into new territory by removing all obstacles such as trees and rocks and other barriers to prepare the road for the advancing army. That's what that word advance means. That there is a group of people that went ahead of the army that cleared every obstacle so that the army could go in and take the territory that they were called to take. So the apostle Paul says that in his imprisonment, which may seem like a setback, actually served to clear the way for the gospel to come to Rome. And for this reason, he was joyful. Have you ever thought about in your own life that maybe the trials that you have experienced or the, the hardships or the things that you have gone through may have paved the way for someone else? that may have opened the door for someone else to experience the gospel of Christ? Have you ever been in a situation where you have walked through a trial or walked through something and then somebody comes up to you and just says, man, I watched you. I watched how you handled that with integrity. I watched how you handled that with character. I watched how you handled that. You didn't gossip or you didn't demean anybody. So what is it about you that makes you different? And that's the open door for you to say, well, man, it's the presence of God in my life that gave me strength in that situation. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Ever happened to you where someone looks at you and just say, man, you handle things differently? Well, you know what? You're paving the way for others to experience the gospel, to experience the reality of Christ by your own experience. So when we walk through our trials, it's opening the door for somebody else to see the fruit of your life, to see how you handled that, and it brought glory to God. So number two, Paul's source of joy was that the gospel was advancing. You know, friends, we are not called to collapse under our trials, and we are not called to live above our trials so much that we don't deal with them. We are called to walk through them with confidence, faith, and trust in who God is in those trials. Number three, the source of Paul's joy was in the opportunities to share the gospel. In verse 13, it says this, it says, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Two years, the Apostle Paul has been in prison. 24 hours a day, he has a guard chained to him. Every six hours is a new guard. So every six hours, Paul sees a new opportunity. For two years. Could you imagine if one of these Roman guards was an atheist? <laughs> and they're coming in for a six-hour shift. They get chained to the Apostle Paul. And the source of his joy begins to bubble up. You know, he's just like, man, I'm a prisoner. I'm a servant of Christ. And I could just see him turning to that Roman guard and going, hi, my name's Paul. I have you for six hours. Guess what we're going to talk about? And then many of these guards that were chained to the apostle Paul, they got saved. Their lives began to change. And you know how I know that? is these guards were part of the Praetorian Guard. And so they were part of the ones that had access to Caesar's household. They were the ones that, that guarded the prisoners that had access to Caesar. But in 4 verse 22 of the book of Philippians, he concludes the letter by acknowledging the saints that were in Caesar's household. So the joy that Paul had was in sharing the gospel with those, and they got saved, and then they took the message and he even got to Caesar's household. So that was a source of his joy 
was the opportunities to share the gospel. Number four, Paul's joy was in, was in others that are encouraged. Others were encouraged, and that brought Paul a lot of joy. In verse 14, he says this. He says, because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And if the worship team could go ahead and come. Paul's adversity had an effect on others. When others saw his courage and faith, they responded with their own courage and faith. To step up, to be bolder, their faith was strengthened and encouraged in Christ. And that was a source of Paul's joy, knowing that others were encouraged by his chains. Although Paul was in prison, he knew that the gospel was not imprisoned, but the gospel was advancing, the gospel was encouraging, and the gospel was changing lives. And for that, Paul was joyful. Could he have been worried, stressed out, fearful? Absolutely. But he was a servant, connected, doulos, completely sold out to Christ. Completely sold out to Christ because Jesus was the center of his life. Six weeks we are going to be discovering, diving into being a prisoner of joy. But do you know Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Jesus had joy as well. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says this, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The greatest act of love, the greatest demonstration of love is the cross of Christ. The greatest source of strength that Paul learned was not in himself, it wasn't in his resources, it was in who Christ is in him. Jesus had joy set before him and that was the source of his strength. And what was that joy? Number one, it was being in the Father's presence that Jesus was able to endure the cross because he knew it was going to lead him back into the Father's presence where there was the fullness of joy. And then number two, for the joy that was set before him, do you know it's you? You are the joy of Jesus. Just think about that for a moment. That before the creation, the foundation of the world, God knew your situation at this moment in time, right here in the chair you're sitting in. God knows the situation that you are in. And it was the joy that was set before him. You are the joy before him. Charles Spurgeon says it this way. He says, the grand great motive of the Savior's suffering is found in the joy of saving us. You are so worth it. You are so worth it. And God loves you so much. He finds so much joy in who you are. We do me a favor and just stand to your feet across this sanctuary. Our faith doesn't deny reality. Our faith is the choice to press into God despite our reality. 
The joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is our strength. The joy of the Lord was Paul's source. And the joy of the Lord and the presence of the Lord is to be our source even when we don't have joy. There's a lot of reasons why my wife is my hero. It was two years ago that on a Saturday morning, we get a a phone call that my wife's mom, my mother-in-law just unexpectedly passed away. It was just, wow, what just happened? She was sitting in her chair and she just up and passed away. Three months later, my father-in-law gets sick and he passes away. There was no joy in that moment. In those months that went on and on, there was no joy. But this is what I saw in my wife. I would see her get up in the morning and turn on worship music and just begin to lift her hands in worship because she knew that Jesus was her source. In the midst of that circumstance, in the midst of that situation, there wasn't any joy there, but there sure was a source that was available to her. And then in the morning, she would put on worship music and I'd come downstairs and our house would be filled with worship music and she was just worshiping in the Lord because it wasn't no fun at that moment, but she knew she had to get to her source. She knew she had to get to her source. And that's the point and that's the focus of Paul and everything that he walked through was that Jesus was his source and that's how he was able to live out to be a prisoner of joy was because that Jesus was his source in the good times, in the prison times, in the bad times, everything that he had. I am, he said, I am simply a servant. I am sold out to God. So it doesn't matter what happens in me because if I live, I'm gonna live for Christ. If I die, I go to be with Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So no matter where I'm living, how I'm living, I have a source that's greater than my circumstance. And it was found in Christ. But I want you to know that you are the joy that was set before Jesus because of his love for you. And I wanna ask you this morning, I wanna ask you, is Jesus the center of your life? Is Jesus the center of your life. Because maybe you're tired of not walking in joy, you're walking in worry and fear. When we make Jesus the source, things begin to change. Things begin to change. I promise you, things will change. And I'm just gonna ask you right now, if you are here and Jesus is not the source of your life, I want you to wave your hand. You need to give your life to Christ. This is the place to begin. This is the place to start. And the second one is this. If you are here this morning and you want to live as a prisoner of joy, you want that joy of the Lord, you want more of that joy of the Lord, I'm just gonna ask you to come to this altar. Just come to this altar and let's lift our hands and let's just worship. Let's just worship the Lord. If you live, you want to be that prisoner of joy. And let's just lift our hands and let's just worship the Lord. Let's just worship Him.
Father, this morning, we choose to live as prisoners of joy. God, we break off, we cast down every worry, every fear, every stress that seems to rob, that would want to rob what you have called us to. God, we break it off and we cast it down in Jesus' name. Father, we pray over these next six weeks, Lord, that we will walk out the joy that you have called us to, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, that you captivate us with your love, that we could live out the joy that you have called us to. Come on, if you agree with that, can we give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that our source is you. Our source of joy is in you. That's where it begins. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. And Father, as we get ready and we are dismissed from this place, Lord, I pray that we would walk out what you have called us to, that we would walk out like Paul to be a prisoner of joy. Father, thank you that you have used us to cut away, to help others, to encourage others by our trials and circumstances, Lord. Now, Lord, we pray that when we walk out these doors, that the world will see the joy that we possess. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. Father's Day next week, next Sunday, serve day on Saturday. Love on some people. God bless you guys. Hey, thanks again for checking out ICLB here on YouTube. Hope you're already subscribed, getting notifications. Make sure you're following us on all our social media channels. Download our mobile app and check us out Sundays, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., online, in person. We want to see you there. God bless.